We're very grateful. And I, I hope you don't mind if I give you a little bit of an introduction while we're waiting for people. No, I don't um, mind at all. So Father Josiah is joining us from Southern California, as you heard, 87 degrees uh, and the envy of everybody here in Michigan. Uh, he was ordained to the Holy Priesthood in 1993 and was awarded the PhD in theology from the University of Durham, England in 2004. And he served as pastor of St. Andrew Orthodox Church in Riverside, California since 1998. And the most, the most amazing part of your entire biography is that you were married in 1988 and have 10 children. I'm suffering with four. You know, I'm kidding. They're wonderful. But 10 children, that's a, that's a, a wonderful and glorious blessing. Um, Father is the founder and director of Patristic Nectar Publications, which is a company dedicated to nourishing the spiritually thirsty with the sweet teachings of the Holy Fathers. Uh, and there's many, there's a lot of wonderful things on that website, including, I believe you just completed the audio version of the Philokalia as well, uh, which is available. And is that, is that, uh, was that available for, for free on the website? Yes. Yes. Father? Okay. Um, he's been, he's an instructor at St. Cyril and Athanasius Orthodox Institute in San Francisco, St. Catherine College. Uh, how do you say that city, Father? San Marcos. In San Marcos. Uh, a member of the Orthodox Theological Society of America and participates in yearly academic forums and symposia. Uh, he's also serving as a member of the Secretariat of the Assembly of Orthodox Bishops in the United States since its inception in May of 2010. Uh, Father Josiah has books and articles that have been published by St. Herman Press, New Rome Press, Zoe Press, St. Vladimir Orthodox Theological Journal, uh, and many, many other uh, different writings. He also has a book, a wonderful book called um, uh, Rock and Sand, which is kind of a, a uh, look back at the history of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, he's also been interviewed on Fox News, Voices of Radio Russia, uh, Voices of Russia Radio, Russian Television, Ancient Faith Radio, and we, and as well as numerous retreats. He was here last in Michigan in the cold. We we always have you during Lent, right? In the when it's still quite chilly here with his uh, uh, with Father Joe Abud up there at uh, Saint George. We had him visit us here a couple years ago, um, and we are grateful to have you once again, Father, and hoping to talk a little bit about your patron which I know you love to, is, is every priest loves to talk about their patron saint. Uh, so I was hoping that you could speak a little bit to us this evening as we prepare for Clean Week coming up next week, uh, a little bit about repentance and, and King Josiah. So I will, uh, I'll let you take it away, Father. <laughs> well, glory to God. And thank you, Father Gabriel, for that introduction. I'm very happy to be with you through this uh, modern zoom technology you made me think when you said that uh, about you made that that poke about my kids you forgot the grandkids my uh my fourth grandchild's about to be born and so i'm i'm feeling particularly rich particularly rich even if the more kids and grandkids that you have the more literally rich <laughs> you lose uh in a different way and a more important way you get a better a better wealth but you made me when, we, when you talked about suffering you made me think of one of the very few jokes i actually can remember i only have like three patent jokes that's all i have but one of them goes like this it it uh it describes marriage and family life as a three ring circus first comes the engagement ring then comes the wedding ring and then comes the suffering <laughs> Yes, indeed. And without that, how will we be saved? Huh? St. Peter says that our faith, which is even more precious than gold tested by fire, is through all of our sufferings brought to fruition, brought to beauty and the salvation of our soul. So you're right. There is a lot of suffering in learning to love and learning to live together as a family. I also agree with you that every priest loves to talk about his patron saint. I, I get to preach on the life of the righteous King Josiah on the Sunday before the nativity of our savior, because he's commemorated in the genealogy, that's genealogy Sunday, and he's commemorated in that genealogy since he's in Jesus's direct line. 
I take that as an occasion for the last oh, 25 years or so uh, to preach a sermon on his life. So it, I, I'm blessed to be able to have my congregation captive since it always falls on a Sunday and to be able to preach about his life. I should say, if it's okay with you, I'd like to just give maybe a basic overview of the life of the righteous King Josiah, and then particularly on your request, highlight uh, that which he's centrally known for, which is uh, the tenderness of his heart and his deep repentance. So the righteous King Josiah died uh, around uh, 605 or so BC. Uh, he was the son of King Amon, the grandson of King Manasseh. We may remember Manasseh because he was such a wretched king and so unfaithful to God, such an idol worshiper. Um, he was known as the, the reason that God abandoned his people to the Babylonians into their terrible exile. Manasseh, though, repented at the end of his life, and we read the prayer of King Manasseh on our knees in the great Compline service uh, in Lent that many of our churches serve uh, each week during Lent. His great-grandfather was the righteous King Hezekiah, who is known in the scriptures as uh, the supreme king of Israel with regards to his faith. The chronicler uh, in the author of First and Second Chronicles describes of all the kings, he says there were four kings of Israel that did something or accomplished something that in their in their lives with God that no other king did. King David is the first. He had a heart for God like no other king. Solomon, his son, was wise like no other king. Hezekiah trusted God. He had faith in God like no other king. And fourth, Josiah. Josiah repented and reformed like no other king. Those are the four kings that are called out by the chronicler. And Josiah, thank God, is one of them. And his memory was uh, precious. It's not just precious in the church. It was, it was precious uh, in the Old Testament church, too, uh, to the Jews. If you read Sirach, uh, which was composed uh, in Greek uh, in probably around the end of the third, beginning of the second century BC, which has this marvelous uh, collection of wisdom literature in it, it dedicates uh, the first few verses, I believe in chapter 47, to the memory of King Josiah. So this is some 400 years after Josiah's death. Um, He's hymned by the writer of Sirach. He says that the memory of Josiah is like sweet incense. Uh, and he taught the people to repent and to uh, follow the commandments of God. So Josiah's memory has been uh, cherished by believers for uh, centuries and centuries. In fact, another very unique aspect of King Josiah's life as a king is that he was prophesied by name by a prophet of Judah 300 years before his birth. So some uh, 10th century or maybe 9th century BC, uh, a prophet foretold under, this was the time of King Uzziah, foretold that one day uh, a king by the name of Josiah would uh, burn the, the bones of the idolatrous priests on their own altars. And it was a fascinating prophecy that no one had any clue what this was referring to until, in fact, King Josiah was born in the 7th century BC and, and began a major reform and purgation of idolatry out of Israel. So let me tell you a little bit more now about him, not just that he was uh, cherished for hundred years before he was born until today. He, when he was, uh, his father was King Amon. When Amon died, Josiah was only eight years old. And he became king with a regent uh, at the age of eight. We don't know much that he did between the ages of eight and 16. But when, it when he was 16, 
uh, the text of the scripture says that he turned his heart to God. He began to seek God. He had a deep spiritual rebirth, uh, a true transformation, and seeking um, God. Four years later, he began, began a major, at the age of 20, he began a major reform project in Judah where he ruled. Remember that uh, after King Solomon's reign, his son Rehoboam was a very bad king and alienated the 10 northern tribes and Israel, the 12 tribes were broken into the 10 tribes of the north and the two, Judah and Benjamin in the south. In 722 BC, the Assyrians came and brought into exile the 10 northern tribes. They were basically sent into exile and never reassembled for their idolatry. Uh, and then, so Josiah is king after that. He governed in the south in Judah when the north was still chaos. Uh, he began his reform project in Jerusalem, in Judah, in the south, and he began to uh, knock down all of the idols that had been erected in imitation of the surrounding pagan nations. He began to knock down all the idols. He would crump, crush their, their marble and their woodwork into dust and then sprinkle it on the graves of the pagan priests. He even uh, exhumed the bones of the priests that led Israel astray and crushed them up uh, and scattered them. He was so zealous uh, for God. He also went beyond the borders of the south, back again into the northern lands, and uh, had a priest, teaching priests, go up there and help people come back to God and work against the idolatry. And then when he was 26, the third major part of his life, uh, he dedicated to the reinvigoration of uh, the worship cycle of the Old Testament church. Uh, the reconstruction uh, and sanctification of the Jewish temple, and the teaching of the law of Moses. This is from 26 until his death at the age of 39, which I'll mention in a second. Um, when he began, the first thing that he did was to, uh, he was providing financial support to workmen, to craftsmen, to uh, reconstruct and rebuild the temple, which was in disarray. And in the process of doing that, uh, one of the workmen found a copy of the law, which had been lost, if you can imagine. I know it's hard for us to imagine. I mean, how, how does the Bible get lost? Well, post 15th century and the invention of book publishing, um, it's hard for us to imagine. But books were very hard and manuscripts were very hard to come, come by and to preserve uh, in the seventh century BC. And in fact, the law of Moses had been lost. Most people think it was the book of Deuteronomy. And he had it found, and when it was found, he had it publicly read before him, which, by the way, Deuteronomy says is the duty of every king, is to keep a copy of the law next to the throne and have it read to him, a portion of it, every day as part of his um, royal duties. Wow, wouldn't we be in better shape today? if we had political rulers who had part of their daily routine is to have God's law read to them. Oof. When he had the law read, he was so grieved uh, that he didn't know it and that Israel, that the people of God had done and were doing so many things that were not pleasing to the Lord, that he wept and he took his royal robes and he tore them there are many uh, artistic depictions of righteous King Josiah tearing his robes. It's been an inspiring uh, visual for artists for more than 2,000 years. He immediately sent word to uh, a, a person that he respect who was a female prophetess named Holda. And he asked her, he sent some of his delegates to ask her, what should they do since he was so worried about the, the judgment of God falling upon them because of their disobedience? And she guided him and blessed his efforts at purge, purging paganism and 
uh, rebuilding the temple and reinstituting the proper worship of the church. And he set his heart on celebrating a great Passover feast, which he did. He basically led the whole nation uh, to recommit themselves to love God and to be his people and to accept God as their God. He led them in what's called covenant renewal um, and celebrated a Passover, the scriptures say, that hadn't been celebrated that great but until the time, since the time of the prophet Samuel, who was, of course, King Saul's prophet hundreds of years before. So this is how he spent his life. He spent his life uh, providing an example of repentance in himself, an example of loyalty to God, and then working for uh, the praise of God and for God's beauty and justice to be expressed in the state of Israel. Uh, throughout his life. He died tragically uh, at the age of 39. Um, it was a big mistake on his part. Uh, I'm hesitant to say, but it's true, a sin, in fact. Um, he was so zealous about protecting Israel that uh, there was a conflict between the Pharaoh of Egypt and the Assyrian king. And Pharaoh was coming with his forces to attack his enemy. And the shortest path was to cut just across the corner of Israel to go across the bottom portion of uh, Judah. And uh, Josiah forbade him. He said, you will not, your pagan armies will not come on our holy ground. And the, the Pharaoh begged him. He said, don't do this. My conflict is not with you. I don't want to kill you, but we certainly will if you do this. And even the prophet Jeremiah, who was Josiah's very good friend, and he actually wrote the lament for Josiah after his death. Uh, Josiah told him, don't go, don't go. But he was too zealous and he did go. And uh, he confronted Pharaoh Necho on the battleground and he was shot by an arrow. Uh, the Jewish tradition says it was, it was shot into his nose. And uh, he was asked, he asked his chariot tier to put him, prop him up and drive him out of the conflict, which he did and then he died. And it says that all of the people of God lamented uh, Josiah for years. They just were so grieved that their great example and their great king uh, had died. And as I said, Jeremiah lamented him at his, uh, uh, for his funeral rites. So this is Josiah. He was, uh, his sons, he had a number of sons who um, were eventually captured by Babylon and uh, Israel saw a tremendous uh, devastation after his, after his death. So that's a little bit about Josiah. It, it, there are five things that are mentioned in the text of Scripture about Josiah's heart. Uh, one I already mentioned, and that is that the Scriptures describe him as being tender-hearted, tender-hearted, and and. For sure, we'll talk about that. I, I wrote down a few more things about his heart. His heart was tender, full of shame, it says, full of shame. And that's an important concept also to understand about repentance is the value and the power of proper shame. The third is that his heart was a heart of repentance. The scripture also said that his heart was, quote, full of godliness. And fifth, his heart was set on the Lord. Those five things, tender, full of shame, deeply repentant, full of godliness, and set on the Lord. Um, his compunction, the, the state of his heart, at recognizing the devastation of his own interior life, his own knowledge of God, which was revealed to him when he heard the, the law of God read. And this is an important connection to, to make. The more, that we, the more that we know the word of God, the more that we understand God's magnificent character, the more we understand our own condition. Sometimes we don't feel very compunctionate or very repentant. But often the reason that we don't feel that way is because our vision of what is normal, what is beautiful, what is godly is not very full 
uh, an example is I've many times I've been asked by parishioners over the years how it's possible that Saint Paul, who was so close to God uh, that three times, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't even know, was taken to paradise and saw things of which he couldn't even speak, couldn't even put them in human words, who performed incredible miracles and suffered so much for Christ, often on the verge of death for years and years and years at a time. How could that man at the end of his life say this to his spiritual son, Timothy? He says, it is a trustworthy statement and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am Number one, I am chief, we translate it. Protos is the word. I am protos. How could that be? Many people, oh, he's, he's, he's talking hyperbolically, or he's exaggerating, or he's just saying that. That is not how the church understands Paul's statement. Paul genuinely believed that he was the chief of sinners. How is that possible with a life like that? Well, the best way I can describe it on how the closer that you get to God, the more compunctionate you become, the more that you have God, the knowledge of God, the more that you see your vacuousness and your need, your sense of need is more profound, is like this. Uh, so you can, can you see I'm wearing a kind of a faded old cassock. <laughs> it's like most of my cassocks and uh, my parishioners and my wife, God bless them all. Are often asking me, if, oh, why aren't you getting? Why don't you get a new cassock? And every now and then I do get a new cassock, but usually not until I really can't wear my old ones anymore. They have uh, they've seen better days, but they've also seen a lot of things. <laughs> and they've been through a lot, and I'm I'm attached to them. One of the things that this cassock has seen is a lot of those ten kids who are now old. My oldest is 32, and my babies turning nine. I can't believe it. I don't know how I'm going to live without her. Uh, many of them fell asleep right here and dribbled snot from their nose right onto my right onto my cassock shoulders. So my cassocks have endured children and now grandchildren slobber for a very long time. Now my wife is a very dutiful wife and she tries to keep me presentable. I thank her for that. She's constantly washing my cassocks and trying to scrub them and make them. But there's only so much you can do if you understand what I'm saying. Now, it's not that big a deal in a situation like this, right? You're looking at me through a computer camera or whatever you're doing. And there's not that much light. But I have this light right here. You see it? If I take that and I put it right there on my shoulder, oh, you do not want to look what you see. This is St. Paul's life. To us, he was perfect. He was the perfect man. He had uh, a heart of purity, but he was so close to God. That uncreated light that he saw on the road to Damascus that left him blind for days, that's the light he sought and he lived in for much of his ministry. And to be that close to God is to see yourself uh, as you really are and to see things that we wouldn't even really notice. So the more that we follow Josiah, the more that we uh, listen like he did so attentively to the word of God, and we let the scriptures have their way with us, right? We, we open our hearts up and we listen to the words of God in the liturgy and in our own scripture study. The more that we grow in the knowledge of God, the more that we have compunction, the more that our hearts are made soft and our eyes become faucets uh, because we see ourselves in our own inner desolation and how far we are from what God would want us to be. So this is Josiah. He had this tender heart. He responded to uh, the word of God by tears and also a willingness to bring forth what St. John the Baptist calls the fruits of repentance. The fruits of repentance. So this is the next point I'd like to make, and that is that repentance isn't just deepened by 
the knowledge of God. It absolutely is. But it always is to prove itself, to show itself by tangible actions. Tangible actions. Remember the context of uh, this quote I just made from St. John the Baptist. The context is the River Jordan. John the Baptist is baptizing the crowds. Masses of people are coming out, confessing their sins publicly and being baptized. And the Pharisees came down, and John was very provoked by their presence because he didn't trust that they actually were repentant, which they weren't. And he told them, you know, what are you doing here, you brood of vipers? He said, bring forth fruits in keeping with repentance. And don't think that you can say uh, that we have Abraham as our father. For God is able to raise up sons from these stones to Abraham. The, the point is that the Pharisees, they, they wanted to, do a, to have a show of repentance. Right? They were there by the waterside. They respected John, and the, all the crowds respected him as a great prophet. But they weren't brokenhearted. They weren't there seriously dealing with their sins. They were a show. They were there for the externals. And John is saying, look, true repentance always issues forth in deeds. And that's the proof of it. That's the difference between a fake repentance and a true repentance. Our deeds show it. Uh, this is one of the reasons that in my own confessional life, and I try to teach my own parishioners this, when we go to confession, when I go, I always begin my confession for asking by asking God to forgive me for my last confession. Not in what I said, but in what I failed to amend. Because if I was more sincerely repentant, I would never repeat my sins. And so I ask God to forgive me for a lack of amendment and to give me the grace that I need from his hands so that I can turn away more you know, sincerely from those things which are so un pleasing, not pleasing to him at all. So Josiah was a model of this. Not only did he have the tears, not only did he have compunction of heart, but he immediately launched on trying to rectify the matter. And in this, he's an incredible uh, model for us. He, he immediately ceased doing what he knew was displeasing to God. And in this case, it was the tolerance of public idolatry. And he immediately began a program of reform. In his case, it wasn't just personal reform. It was that, but also public reform. He immediately began uh, the promotion of worship and people who re repent, uh, take worship exceedingly seriously since the first four of the Ten Commandments are all about the worship of God. He also launched... Uh, a program to do good, not just to raise up true worship, but to, to nourish people in the right way. He sent teachers out. He sought the good and uh, benefit of his citizenry there in the Holy Land. He tried to shepherd them like a good king does and provide a great example for them. And for parents and for we who live in the world, this is also a clear way that we show our own repentance is that we try to fashion ourselves such that we are a benefit to those that we love and that God has put around us, to our spouses if we're married, to our children or grandchildren, to our godchildren, to our fellow parishioners, to our co-workers, uh, even to our enemies, even to our enemies. That is what a spirit of repentance produces, is a life in which the fruits of repentance uh, are bringing, are appearing, are appearing. I'd like to just stop right there for a moment. And um, before I continue with a little bit more about aspects of repentance, I want to ask if there's any questions that anyone would like to ask about the life of King Josiah. Is it, and you could do that in the chat over on the right. And while people are, are thinking, uh, can I ask a, a quick question you mentioned about 
uh, tears of repentance, you know, and, and the importance of tears of repentance. And what are some concrete ways, you know, especially coming up here to Great Lent that, I mean, I think sometimes we've all had those confessions where we, we come up and we can't quite, you know, the tears are an incredible gift, right? How do we, in what concrete ways can we continue to, to generate tears of repentance, like true tears of repentance whenever we come to confession? Do you have any thoughts on that? It's a wonderful question. Thank you, Father. So yes, I have thoughts on it. Let me say first what I would not encourage, and that is going to confession and squeezing them out. <laughs> uh, tension uh, is not the source for tears, and there are many different types of tears. And the kind of tears that are valuable are tears of, of forgot to God are tears of compunction. There's also tears of grief, uh, perhaps generated from not the most beautiful things, uh, maybe loss or something like that. That's not, that's not relevant to us uh, in confession. The best way to obtain tears is to have a high opinion of them, and we should, because the church fathers describe tears as a, as a second or a renewed baptism. Tears are extremely powerful to wash away that even the really deep dirt that gets stuck in our heart, tears can loosen it and help it go away. So uh, we should esteem it highly and things that in the spiritual life we esteem highly, we work hard to obtain. And the best way to obtain the tears is to ask God for them. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. If you don't have tears, then that can be a part of your confession itself. It's often on my list, my tearlessness. I admire so much the, the great priests and bishops of the church, many of whom are saints, who are recorded in the, in the synaxaria of the church as wetting the ground in front of the altar when they serve. Oh my gosh, I read that and I... I honor that. I, I feel such a uh, admiration for those soft-hearted men. And I think what, what a liturgy that must be uh, to have been their parishioners and to see that. I, when I was a brand new priest, like, I don't know, months, months as a priest, I was at a con-celebrated liturgy at uh, one of our cathedrals in Los Angeles, the OCA Cathedral there beautiful church and it was full of beautiful people and one of the priests was a very old man and at the time of the reception of the gifts when the clergy were receiving the eucharist he had tears pouring out of his eyes as he was as he was receiving and i noticed it and i i admired it um i thought to myself what a what a beautiful heart and then afterwards he was, uh, he, he, he couldn't walk very well. And he walked up to me whom he did not know. I, I had never met him and he had never met me. And he, he grabbed me by the shoulders and he kissed me on both cheeks. And he said to me, dear father, congratulations. Congratulations on receiving the body and blood of our savior, Jesus Christ. And I just lost it. I'm just like, get me out of here. I couldn't maintain my composure. Uh, but I thank God it was a gift to me at the very beginning of my priesthood. It was a gift to me of um, what I want to be like, how I'd like to be. So asking for tears is, uh, and, and valuing it is key. And if you don't have it, uh, don't think about it. Don't make a fuss about it when you're confessing. If you don't have it, then I would say do that which is so important for us, and that is learn to endure yourself. Learn to endure. Learning to be patient and to accept ourselves as we are, um, that doesn't mean without a great ambition to improve and to love more. We want to do that. But accepting and enduring ourselves without taking ourselves too seriously, 
uh, and without allowing our condition to throw us into discouragement or to depression. This is very, very important thing to do because God loves us and endures us. And nothing that we do uh, is can overcome the mag magnitude of his own love and affection for us and his willingness to put up with us. And it's important to remember that. That, that can bring tears itself, to remember of how much God endures us and how much he's willing to do anything to endure us. What a God we serve and how loved we are. Father, there was a question in the chat asking if there is a good uh, book or guide that you would recommend to help someone do a proper confession. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> part, of, uh, part of our catechism here at the parish includes uh, not just a lecture on confession, which we give during the Lenten period, but we pass out four or five confession preparations. There are literally hundreds of these uh, that are in print in all the nations of, in all the languages of orthodoxy. Uh, but there are a number that we use that I particularly like. Uh, one is uh, a collection of questions that the late Father Thomas Hopko created for confession based upon the Beatitudes found in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's simply marvelous. And it's in a little pamphlet called, If We Confess Our Sins. Uh, I have it, Father, as a PDF. If you ever wanted it, you could just email me and I'll have my secretary who manages our catechumen send it to you. Um, another is a, a collection based upon the Ten Commandments. This is found in the little pocket prayer book that the Antiochian Archdiocese publishes that's very popular. I think it's sold over a million copies over the years. Um, another is a confession preparation that was written by St. John of Kronstadt that is just superb. And the reason it's nice to have a variety of these confession preparations, and I rotate them and I encourage people to rotate them, is because when you're examining yourself, you know, you are a 3D person, so to speak. And to examine yourself from different angles through different confession prep, you know, the questions that they ask are not the same. Uh, one of the questions that Father Thomas Hopko asked that just penetrated me, and I've never forgot it, is he, he talks about uh, mourning with those who mourn, and he talks a lot about wretchedness and whether we are willing to love the wretched or re be repulsed by the wretched. And he asks very particular questions about entering into the wretchedness of others uh, that is so Christian. And I had never even contemplated that in confession using other guides. When I first read that, I thought, oh, my gosh. Wow. So this is why I encourage the use of different confession preparations, because you really can get a, a more, more full orbed perspective of yourself, your strengths and weaknesses, and particularly your sins by allowing different spiritual fathers to ask you and kind of probe you in different ways. Would you, do you use those as well? I mean, we have, we're, we're bringing, by the grace of God, we're bringing in eight people this Lent to, to, uh, to Holy Orthodoxy, right. and they're all going to be doing their life confessions. Is there anything, uh, would you recommend those texts also for, for life confessions, or is there anything specific you would do for that? Yes. So um, in the segment on confession that we go through with our catechumens, we give them these catechumens. I also give them kind of a uh, a brief kind of word about preparing a life confession. And what I encourage them to do uh, is to clear a half hour of their life and to guarantee quiet and to simply light a candle and stand before the icon of our Savior and read the 50th Psalm. And after reading the 50th Psalm, to sit down and to move in their mind to their earliest memories and with a pad of paper to write down uh, step by step, all that they remember in their own conscience. And from that moment until the present day. And then I ask them to take one of these preparation guides and go through that. The reason I do that is because just because you're, you know, you, first lifting your, to your conscience is a great thing to do. And it's the reason we have conscience. Conscience is an incredible gift from God. But also we recognize that our, con our conscience has fallen like the rest of us. Our conscience is fallen and not perfect, which is why following it up with uh, an examination based upon the commandments or the Beatitudes of Christ 
this is very important because there may be things that we don't even consider to be sins that he does. So the preparation can be a, an illumining experience in which we understand more of the will of God for our life. And then to come to confession, even before they're received, come to confession as soon as they're prepared and make their life confession. In that case, the priest doesn't absolve the person. Um, he can pray for them. I always pray for those who are confessing. I'm, I ask God to strengthen them in their quest for purification, which is what catechism is all about. And then to let that be the launching pad for a life of faithful confession. Start with your life confession. Now it's all out there. And now you can keep a short account. I encourage people to not let a more than a month go by where they don't look at their heart, pull out any weeds that are growing, write them down, just like they did with, we did with their life confession. Of course, it's going to be a much smaller list month by month. But that way, they're, they're cultivating the ground, the earth of their heart. And that's the way to let the water of the Holy Spirit, the grace of the Holy Spirit to come in, and also to bring forth good fruits. If they keep, if they use life confession as a springboard into a faithful life of regular confession, where they don't let their, their carelessness get ahead of them, and they keep a, a faithful monthly confession until their last breath, and then they can face the end with peace. I didn't see any more questions at this point, Father, in the chat. So okay, thank you. Can I, if it's okay, Father Gabriel, I, what I'd like to do now is to turn a little bit from Josiah and to simply talk about uh, repentance in a little bit deeper way. It's okay. Please. All right. So, the first thing I'd like to say about repentance in general is that repentance for us is a way of life. Uh, it is for every human being simply an act of being human. It's an act of living in the truth. It's an act of stepping into the light. Uh, and there is nothing bad about it. <laughs> there is nothing bad about it. There is not an ounce of repentance that you will offer to God that you will ever regret. The only thing that we will regret is not repenting sufficiently. Repentance is, and this is my point, a Christian way of life. It is literally a way of life. It is what we do before we're baptized. It's what brings us to baptism. Just think of uh, St. Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. He preached the gospel. He announced to everyone the incredible wonders of the Lord, what God had done by sending his son to conquer our enemies, sin, death, which had never been conquered. No one had ever faced death. No one had ever gotten into the ring with death and survived. Every single human being, even the righteous, when they got into the ring with death prior to Jesus's death, had been KO'd, completely leveled. Jesus comes, gets into the ring, and kills death. <laughs> death literally bit him, thinking that it had a man and found itself face to face with God, the services of Holy Week say. And that is exactly what Jesus did. And Peter announced it, victory over death the conquering of sin, the crushing of the devil, the plundering of the strong man's house. And people were so moved, but they were also gripped by the reality that they had just crucified their savior. They had just hung him on a cross, the man who had come to save them. And so they cried out to Peter, Peter, what should we do to be saved? And the first thing he said, repent. And then he said, be baptized and wash away your sins. Baptism is the culmination of repentance, the initial phase of repentance. But baptism, I mean, repentance is a way of life. It's what you do before baptism, and it's what you do after baptism. And it's what you do all the way to the end, is deepen your repentance and learn to repent of your previous repentance. So this is my first uh, point, is that repentance is the fundamental reorientation of a Christian, and it's extremely uh, important. It's the characteristic of every man and woman who has become well-pleased new God, or as we, we call them, have become saints. They all have a deeply penitent, compunctionate spirit. They're not moping. As a matter of fact, repentance and joy are linked intimately like this. The saints are full of joy, inexpressible, and full of glory, Peter says. But Christians who are mature are people who 
know who they are before God. They know their sins and they're working in a repentant way against them. This is the door to humility. This is how a person develops humility. And remember, there's only one place in all the gospels that Jesus pulls back the veil towards his heart and allows us in to see actually what his heart was like. It's described in Matthew 11. And Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And here it comes. For I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So developing a gentle and a humble heart, this is, this is what we're shooting for. And this is why repentance, this is what repentance produces uh, universally in the lives of the saints. There's no time that we are going to stop repenting until sin is no longer a reality in our life, which will take place at the second coming of our Savior. When, when we finally meet death or the second coming, whichever comes first for us, then our sins will stop uh, and our repentance will come to an end because we won't have anything else to repent of. But really developing that as a mentality, that this is what my life is about, is developing repentance as a way of life. This is extremely important. And if I could say just a word since hearing about your converts, this can be extremely challenging for converts who are coming to Holy Orthodoxy from other Christian traditions, especially Protestant traditions, especially various forms of evangelicalism, which are very focused on external righteousness. It can be very, very hard for a person to come into the church and to accept the reality that they're sinners. And the church, of course, is constantly working to convince us of this because we constantly forget that we're sinners, right? We, we know it in our heads, but a lot of times we don't even remember it, let alone experience it, that we are. And so that process in which the church is constantly trying to help us live in the truth of who we are, while at the same time, completely inundating us with the love of God, such that we have a secure foundation that allows us to accept the truth about ourselves without insecurity. This is what enables us. The love of God and his embrace of sinners is what enables us to accept the truth about ourselves and that, that we're really much more troubled than we'd like to let on. This is a, the most important mental adjustment for many converts. Uh, and it doesn't just come. It comes through a process of faithfully confessing and looking at their interior life. That kind of life, an interior life, where we're more concerned about ourselves on the inside than we are about, you know, President Biden or Vladimir Putin or, or your local mayor or whatever, the more that we're concerned about us and our own interior life, uh, the greater that the grace of God can penetrate us. And this becomes the great gift that we can give to our loved ones, to our spouses, to our kids, to our friends, is our own interior life. That's in fact a quote from the late father Alexander Elchaninov, who wrote uh, a marvelous, what's become a classic now called uh, The Diary of a Russian Priest. He says that, he says, a parent's interior life is the greatest gift that they can give to their children. And I don't think it just applies to parents. I think in general, it's the truth. So this is my first point, you all, is that repentance is a way of life and there will never be a moment in this earthly life that repentance isn't our goal. The second, I want you to see that repentance is absolutely central to all preaching. And this is important because there's a lot of preaching in America that's just nonsense. Some of the largest churches in the United States, like Joel Osteen in, in Houston, is all about feel-goodism. It's about Jesus is here to help you become a better version of you and uh, to help you have a more fulfilled life. Uh, this is complete nonsense. Jesus is here to save you, to save you from real tangible enemies, sin, death, and the devil. And that means that if he's going to save you, he has got to convince you that you need to be saved, <laughs> which means a call to repentance, right? And a call to examine your heart and to see what's really in there. This is why John the Baptist preached repentance, beginning, middle, and end. And it's why Jesus did. 
Do you know what Jesus' first word was in his first public sermon? Repent. And he preached repentance his whole public ministry. And then at the end of his life, after his glorious resurrection, he was about to ascend from the Mount of Olives to go and sit at the, his father's right hand uh, to take his seat and to put his, uh, his self in the throne of David and govern the world until all of his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. What did he say? He said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It was literally his first words, his first, pub, his first public words, and his last public words is to repent. It's central to all preaching. And of course, the best preachers are those who are repenting the best themselves, right? Who are speaking from experience. They're not just telling their people like, they, like they're somehow in the know, right? They don't need this anymore. But you over there, you need it. No, 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 no. Nobody listens to a man like that. But the best preachers are those who are able to speak from their own compunction, from their own effort to love God and to repent and to change their ways. These are the words that, that connect fallen man and God. Just imagine Adam and when he fell away from God and his alienation from God. When, when you hear those words, repent for the kingdom of God, this is God bowing down and putting his hand out and saying, here, uh, the kingdom's here. Let's start our dialogue again. Let's renew our dialogue since it's broken. That, that's what, how we should hear this, this word of repentance. You know, St. Paul says that repentance from dead works, from lifeless actions that aren't beautiful, is a foundational doctrine. He wrote this to the uh, epistle. He wrote this in the epistle of the Hebrews in chapter six. He says that he doesn't want to again lay the doctrines, the foundational doctrines of which include repentance from dead works. They wanted to press on to more mature things, he said, but they were having a hard time being able to press on because they, they weren't getting it. Um, Repentance is just basic. It's also the reason that the world continues. We know this from Second Peter. St. Peter says in his second epistle, in chapter 3, verse 9, he says, many were complaining against the apostles and saying, where is the appearance of Jesus' is coming? You're preaching his return, but where is it? And he said that they were misjudging God's patience, not understanding that God wanted no man to perish, but every man to come to repentance. So Peter's perspective was the reason God was enduring mankind was to give people an opportunity to find themselves, an opportunity to discover their sins and a, a, the solution in the love of God for their sins. It's the reason that the world keeps going. Jesus also made it very clear that repentance is for every person. There is no person who doesn't need repentance. Um, it's not just for people outside the church. It's for us. It's for Christians. This is, we know this. Uh, at one example is that in the apocalypse, in the revelation of St. John, in the seven letters that Jesus wrote to John to have him give to the seven churches of Asia Minor, in all but two of them, so five of those sevens, Jesus called on the church to repent and he was very serious he also said if you don't repent i'm going to blow out your candlestick you're not going to exist as a church anymore and there are plenty of, of our churches that don't exist anymore because we lost our spirit of repentance so here's jesus speaking to his people and asking these orthodox christians practicing their faith in the early church a time of great vibrancy asking them to repent because he was watching and he was noticing Repentance is, is for believers. As a matter of fact, that most famous verse from the seven letters, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Uh, many evangelists use that verse to ask non-Christians to make a decision for Christ, to call out on to, to his name in faith and to repent, which is a wonderful use of that verse. But that's not what the verse means. The verse was addressed not to unbelievers, to make them believers. The verse was ordained to Christians in the church of Laodicea, and the supper was the Eucharist, and Jesus was so fed up with their pride that he had removed himself from the Eucharistic meal and was standing outside the door of the church. Can you imagine Sunday liturgy? But everybody's there except Jesus, who's on the outside, and he's knocking, and he says, open to me and let me in. Uh, repent, and I'll come and be with you again in the Eucharist. <laughs> 
repentance is absolutely central and it's for every person. It's for every person. There's a, a beautiful story about the life of one of the desert fathers. You may know it. St. Moses, the Ethiopian. He, uh, he had been a bandit, like literally a murderer and a robber uh, before he became a Christian. And God washed those, his sins away and he became a very, very accomplished monk. And once he was so revered by the monastic council of the area that they asked him to come and render judgment upon a sin that a monk had done. And he, he conceded in obedience to the request. And he, but before he did, he took a basket and filled it with sand and poked a hole in the bottom of it, threw it over his shoulder and then walked to the council. And as he was walking to the council, all the sand was going out behind him through the hole. And when he came in amongst the fathers, they laid the case out before him. They said, what's your judgment? And he said, you're going to ask me, a man who has sins flowing out behind him, like the sand is pouring out from my back to render judgment upon another person? <laughs> Can't do that. Can't do that. It was a beautiful witness. And here's a man who had lived decades, uh, completely dedicated to God and had become so holy that he was deeply revered throughout the whole Egyptian desert. And here he is saying that he considers, considered himself uh, very much engaged in the process of repenting for his own current sins. What exactly is repentance? Repentance is a complete change of mind and heart from sin to God. It's not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewal of our mind. It's literally... Um, a 180 degree turn. I want to tell you five words, five words that exist in the New Testament that describe repentance, because repentance can't be described just by one word. It's such a full concept. It's such a magnificent, uh, full word. The first word is metamelome. It, it means remorse. It means to feel compunctionate about what you've done. Another word in the New Testament is metastrophe. Metastrophe, it means a, a drastic or a dynamic life change from a, a previous way of life that you now despise to something else. A third word used in the New Testament is metathesis. Metathesis is a, a conscious decision to alter your living space in order to be near God and away from that which is ugly. A fourth word is metamorphosis, right? You're familiar with this word because it's the word for transfiguration that we use. It's the name of the icon of the feast of Jesus' transfiguration. And it means a complete spiritual and physical transformation that passes us uh, into the glory of God. And the last word that I want to mention, all of these are used, of course, uh, to describe repentance in the New Testament. The last is metania, which means... Uh, uh, a renewal of the heart and mind, a turning from sin to God that renews the heart and mind. All of those things, uh, all of those words together kind of collectively flesh out exactly what repentance is, this complete change of mind and heart. And I'll just mention that it's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle from God. In fact, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostles tell people that Jesus bestows repentance as a, as a divine gift. And in fact, Jesus himself in the 16th chapter of John describes the conviction of sin that we have, which is part of our repentance, as a literal miracle of the Holy Spirit of God in our life. He says that I will send forth the Spirit and he will convict the world of sin and judgment. That's incredible. That's incredible. Sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. So when we feel conviction, Instead of pushing it away, we should make our cross and thank Jesus for working a miracle by his Holy Spirit inside of us. And the more that we receive that, the more that we are willing to pay attention to that, the more clearly the Spirit of God will speak to us. It works the same way with the human conscience. The more that we pay attention to our conscience, the louder the conscience speaks and vice versa. If we ignore the conscience, when the conscience tells us something, oh, you shouldn't have said that. If you stop and said, oh, what should I have said? Do I need to ask forgiveness? 
and then you execute, you actually bring forth the fruit of repentance and you ask forgiveness. And then the next time the Holy Spirit or your conscience speaks clearer, more loudly in a way that you can understand better. Okay, one more word and then uh, I'll stop and see if you have any questions. There is repentance for exterior acts and then there is repentance for interior movements of the soul and the mind and the will. One time when I was a catechumen, I was living in the city of Santa Barbara, California, and I was in the process of being prepared for to be received into the church. Uh, I met, I was so blessed because I met uh, a nun, one of our Orthodox nuns who lived like a few blocks from me. I had no idea that she was there. She was in a small OCA church that had an apartment attached. She and another nun had come there on the direction of her bishop. And uh, her name is Mother Victoria. I ended up befriending her. She, she opened her heart to talk to the troubled young man that I was, and my wife as well. And we ended up becoming friends. And for the last 30 years, we've been very, very close friends. And she now has a marvelous, marvelous monastery that some of our own parishioners from my parish have actually gone and become nuns at. I, as I was observing her life, right? Here I am, this, this young Presbyterian convert going through catechism. And I, I was observing her life, which was so splendid and radiant to me, the way she lived, the way she talked, the way she thought, the way she prayed. I started going twice a week to their, their morning services and just drinking it in. And I, I found out that they confessed quite regularly. And I was completely shocked. I thought, what in the world do you have to confess? You never even leave this place. And you pray eight hours a day. <laughs> you do, what, are you, what are you repenting of? And she looked at me and she kind of shook her head in that motion like, oh, you have a lot to learn, <laughs> which I did. And then she goes, Father, the, the, the war is here. The war is here. It was a, a splendid word to me. It really, it touched me. She was letting me know that uh, exterior repentance is very important, but that's where it starts. You press in from the outside into the inside. And then you have, of course, your, your heart to deal with, your mind to deal with, your will to deal with, which are interior realities. And Jesus says they're the most important because out of the heart comes that which defiles a man. Adultery and fornications and judgments and murders, etc. He says they come from here. So the goal of our repentance is to get our hearts cleansed, right? To let the love of God, which the Holy Spirit sheds abroad in our heart, dominate instead of our, our unworthy designs. And she taught me that there's a, the exterior repentance is the easy part. I don't want to just, you know, discourage catechumens from focusing on that or take for some that can be very, very hard if they haven't spent a life trying to conform their lives to the commandments, which is what catechism is about. But the real world is in here. This is the next move uh, is onto the interior. So I'll stop there and ask if there's any questions uh, on that. Uh, there, there's some questions that are coming in from down from our little uh, group that's watching down in the church. Um, uh, the first one is, how do we find comfort and joy in Christ and the salvation offered to us while balancing humility and the shame of repentance? Oh, that's so good. Oh. Well, the first thing I would say is that for, for Christians, uniquely, the shame and sorrow that comes from it and joy are not antitheses. They coexist. And to make that affirmation, I'll, I'll make this point, and that is that, you know, when, when, we, won the, when we won the world, when we won the Greco-Roman world to Christ, we were able to inherit the, the whole cultural and intellectual apparatus of the Greek world, which, which was an incredibly large literary philosophical world, linguistically, incredibly large semantic world. But there were, so, so the church fathers were constantly taking the, the common parlance, Greek language, and packing it with Christian meaning, which means that you might take this word and you have to like expand it a little bit. 
uh, to include some unique nuance of the Christian faith. Or maybe this word over here, it's, it's decent, but not all of it's decent. So we're going to shrink it in its semantic range. This is something that, that the great fathers of the church did. They were constantly massaging, Christianizing language. Well, one thing they couldn't do is find any Greek word to describe the subject we're talking about today, which is joyful repentance. They couldn't do it. So we actually invented some words. And one word that we invented is this marvelous word. It's a compound word from two Greek words, lipi, which means sorrow, and hara, which means joy. And we put them together into a word called harmolipi. Harmolipi means joyful sadness. That's the best translation, I think. Joyful sadness. We find this word first uh, ever uh, in uh, the in literary form in the ladder of St. John of Sinai. We can't find it before that. It may have existed before that, but St. John's the first one that we know of used it. And the reason is because this miracle of human salvation hadn't existed before. The making of saints, the bestowal of the Holy Spirit upon mankind, which took place on Pentecost, which launched this aggressive human race for paradise, for the kingdom of God, which has produced innumerable saints, uh, while being in our bodies, which are still fallen, uh, with a, an old man that is shot and dying, but still has some activity in us, right? We have to, Paul says, learn to put to death the movements of the old man to slaughter him. He's been dethroned, but he's still causing us problems, some more than others. <laughs> so this, this reality of having the joy of the Lord, which I quoted earlier from St. Peter, is inexpressible and full of glory. And at the same time, the knowledge of our sins, a, a more penetrating knowledge by the grace of the Holy Spirit and his miracles than any people prior to the Christian faith could ever know, holding those together creates our disposition of constant joy and constant sadness at the same time. So this is a natural, this is a natural creation. If we allow ourselves to be molded by the church, this is what we get. We get incredible joy and incredible sorrow. Uh, together and we see this don't we also in jesus's teaching about repentance just think about what he says happens when one sinner repents he says that even the angels share the joy of heaven god is so happy that his radiance is passed on to the angels and they're so happy and one sinner who repents so here we have we have the context of repentance and sorrow and the repent and the reality of joy at the same time and we experience this in, in our own hearts Shame, therefore, is not something to be uh, resisted if it's a proper shame that comes from our sins. And we learn that from the life of King Josiah. In fact, it becomes fuel to birth righteousness. This is what we see in, in Josiah's life. He felt deeply grieved. And at the same time, it helped him uh, to take the actions that were necessary, many of which were very difficult. Uh, repentance is not easy, but to take the actions, you know, I, I encourage one of the greatest sins that we, we all pastors are, are just inundated with today is the sin of internet pornography. And one of the great threats of internet pornography is that uh, when you're exposed to this filth over and over, you can lose your shame. And so much so that that men take unbelievable risks, risks to their own relationship with God, to their own relationship with their spouses, if they're married with their, to their girlfriends, if they're in a relationship to their coworkers, so much so that, that they get desensitized to it. And that shame, which we naturally feel in a circumstance like that, um, in dabbling in a circumstance like is designed to drive us to, to take the actions that are necessary in my own little life, in my own context, my own pastoral context, the men who have succeeded in escaping from the real tangible addiction to internet are those who have shackled their shame and allowed it to bring forth the drastic decisions that must be made by an addict to pornography if they're going to escape. They're going to have to take drastic, drastic actions, which means jettison, jettisoning their smartphones, period, removing themselves from private computer access, and then enduring the pain of the neurological addiction uh, over a period of time until it lessens so that they can res resume a normal life. That can only be done with shame. 
There was another question, Father. And I, 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 I'm not following the question, but maybe you could, maybe by reading it, you could, you could hear it. But it was, it's in the chat. It says, "Could we use repentance as a guide for what is or is not moral?" Uh, and he says, "An example: If I were a pacifist and repented against pacifism, versus thinking just war is just and repenting." Do you follow well, the question? Uh, yeah, I think I think I get the question, and I would say no, absolutely not. Um, because only if you had a perfectly formed conscience and a perfectly clean heart. It's better instead to use the lives of the saints as your fleshed out judgment about what's what's appropriate and what's not. That's the that's the standard that we should look for. It's the life of Christ incarnate at our time. So looking at the saints and the collection of the saints, it helps us have the we see what's the common standard and we see also what could be possible uh, in a collage of opinions and dispositions uh, so that we don't fall either into over -permiss permissiveness or its opposite. And I, I have one question or maybe some advice you can impart, uh, you know, as a convert to orthodoxy from, from the Protestant realm, what was your, what would you, if you could go back to your, your, your days as a catechumen before you experienced your very first clean week, Great Lent and Pascha, would you impart any words of wisdom? I mean, you, and I hope that everybody, most of these people here are, are parishioners of the church, uh, and you will take note of what Father Josiah has said earlier, is that repentance, people that are repentant take worship services seriously, and there is church every day next week, sometimes multiple times a day, you know, so make sure that you are, that you are present, and I'll continue to harp on you for that. Uh, but, in the, but in the meantime, is there anything or any parting advice that you could give to catechumens who are experiencing their very first canon of St. Andrew, their very first uh, pre-sanctified liturgies, their very first uh, Holy Week? Is there any, anything that you could, you could pass on to them? Well, part of me wants to say I'm jealous, I must say. Uh, 1992 was, was my catechism year, and I, uh, I remember being completely overwhelmed I remember making my first life confession. I can still see my hand shaking. <laughs> I, I had written everything out. I was absolutely terrified. I had never confessed. I mean, I, I thought I had, right? I had confessed to God out loud, privately, uh, but never the way that the Bible asks us to confess to another human being, let alone a priest. And uh, I, I remember the feeling I had of utter terror going to confess. Uh, to my catechist and confessor, God rest his soul. Uh, and I also remember the feeling afterwards of unbelievable resolution. Uh, I remember my first Sunday of orthodoxy and being completely enraptured uh, in the truth of the faith once delivered to the saints. Uh, so I would I would say do engage, do engage, and know you have no idea how glorious it is. You may think you know, you may have watched some videos, you may have heard from people. It is so much beyond anything you've heard. And I would simply say that that's my feeling every year as I re-experience this holy season. I heard a word from an incredible monk that I, I follow and I'm very devoted to. His name is Father Zacharias Zaharu. He's spiritual son of St. Sophroni in the monastery of St. John the Baptist in Essex, England. And uh, he says, he said something, he was in my parish once, uh, there you have it, at the doors of the Great Lent, oh my gosh. He, um, he said something to me when he was here uh, years and years ago, I guess it was probably 20 years ago now. He was here giving a retreat and he said, there is enough grace in holy work holy week to sustain a believer for an entire year i'm like what i mean i had no idea that it was true and i i have found it to be true so i would say engage and receive as much as you possibly can but know this every year as you love god more your capability of receiving god grows which and he is a god of generosity he's going to fill you and fill you and fill you and fill you so every experience Every re-engagement in the sacred period uh, is going to exceed the previous. 
We are extremely excited here to to get to kick it off here on Sunday. Just this this wonderful season of repentance, this joyful sorrow, as you kind of as you described uh, in your talk. If there was no more questions, I just I wanted to once again thank you for taking time out of your your busy schedule to talk about your patron and about repentance, this incredibly important theme that is so needed right before uh, we hit clean week. Oh, and there was I guess I did miss a question. Uh, why is this, uh, I've, oh, I've been to Orthodox services when the priest offered a general confession to all in the parish with the absolution prayer. Is this considered valid as, as valid as a one-on-one -on -one confession? Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, that's not to say, however, that there isn't a place for it in unique circumstances, like the practice of St. John of Kronstadt, where he had literally hundreds and hundreds of people confessing, and he was simply incapable of taking care of all of their confessions. So I'm not in any way judging a saint, God forbid. But uh, I've, I've been formed uh, by the church and by my own spiritual father in our practices that it's, it's not to be done. Uh, certainly as an alternative to confession to a priest. The benefit of it is that it does bear witness to the fact that there's no such thing as private confession. Uh, when a priest hears a confession of a parishioner, that's not a private thing in the sense that it's done publicly in the church, in front of people, and uh, the idea that somehow we don't have a, a larger accountability to the community, I think that's important to emphasize. We do. And we don't want to think that this is just between me and my confessor and God. We're members of the parish, and what we do, for good or ill, it has a tremendous implication on everyone. And I think the, the practice of confessing out loud, uh, even if it's to a priest, but out loud, uh, so other people hear, that's uh, as it was done often in the early church. I understand it as a beautiful thing. There was a question from the, 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 the basement here that said, uh, what happens to the indelible seal I received as a Roman Catholic? Uh, does he, is this a former priest? I mean, there, there's the, an indelible mark of the priesthood that Catholics teach, which we don't think is true. Um, is, is it, if it's a former priest, then I would say there is no such thing. I don't, I don't think, I don't think there's any former priests in the catechumens the, the catechumens I have. <laughs> what, what, are, what do they mean by a indelible seal? I'll ask them to, 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 uh, to. Father, to, yeah, they said in their confirmation, they were given this as part of their confirmation into the Roman Catholic faith. Well, uh, all I would say is that uh, if what you received in confirmation was recognized by the Orthodox Church as being full uh, full chrismation, you would not be converting to Holy Orthodoxy right now. So whatever it was, uh, however well intended, it was insufficient, and you're going to receive the real thing. Any other questions for Father? This has been an absolutely wonderful way, like I said, to kick off Clean Week. So thank you again for your time. Please send some of the 87 degrees over here to, to Michigan so that we could process outside for Orthodoxy Sunday. I'm blowing and, the sun over to you. Yes, we're not stuck inside for our processions. And there's Pascas that we have snow, and then there's Pascas where it's in the 70s. So it's always a, a hit or miss here. So... Uh, but very, make, I hope that God blesses you and your parish with a, just an absolutely wonderful uh, and very deep and spiritual clean week. And continue to keep us in your prayers, too, here in Fenton as well. Thank you, Father, and all your parishioners. I, I wish I was there in person and I could have more human interaction. I only see your face uh, on my computer. It's a very nice face to see, by the way. But uh, thank, you. thank you for your, your kind hospitality and for your prayers. And I ask that please don't forget us out here, please. Absolutely not. Absolutely. So we will, Father, can you uh, end with a prayer before we sign off? Please. Of thank course. You. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Send forth, Heavenly Father, the grace of thy most pure spirit into our hearts. Birth within us contrition and sincere repentance. Receive us, thine unworthy children, in the embrace of love. Guide us and save us through these holy days of great Lent and grant that we might share the joy of the resurrection of thy son on holy Pascha and receive our praise, which we send up to thee and to thine only begotten son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in thy most pure spirit now and unto the ages. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Have a great uh, rest of the evening as well. You also. Mm -hmm.